Hi, I'm Kent Anderson. I'm here to be your grouchy skeptic, but I need my slides. Just making me grouchier. There we go. All right, so I'm going to talk about reproducibility from sort of a conceptual standpoint. And anytime there's this level of sensationalism and um, feel good negative energy in a weird way, it makes me a little skeptical. So I'm calling my t mind turtles all the way down, which you might remember refers to an old way of talking about how the earth rested. What did it rest upon? The back of a tortoise. What did that tortoise rest on? The back of another tortoise. How, what happened? Well, it's turtles all the way down. You start talking about reproducibility, and earlier there was the uh, reference to the studies that weren't reproducible in psychology, and the finding that a certain percentage weren't reproducible, and the, even the finding in the particular study about reading words about old age and walking slower, that wasn't reproducible. Did anyone reproduce the study that didn't reproduce that? No, because we accepted that and moved on. So do we reproduce everything, or do we accept and move on? or some blend. That particular set of studies I think that we referred to earlier, 39% were found to be reproducible to a very various degrees, 61% not. Um, it's interesting though, we don't have all that much information about any of this and what they found. And if you read a little bit more about these, you see some of the issues with reproducibility coming to the fore. So the replicators in this case had mostly qualitative assessments. And whether a replication attempt is con considered successful is not entirely straightforward. Who assesses that? How does that get assessed? And do we need to test that replication? So replication is difficult as is measuring its success. So we may say that replication or reproducibility is a desired state, but how do we actually do that? How do we execute it? And how do we validate that it actually occurred or didn't? Those same sets of studies when they said, well, if you don't just look at their statistical power, but you look at whether they were moderately similar to the findings that were professed initially, and a lot of these are psychology experiments where people change, cultures change, society changes, Another 24 were found to be reasonably close. So now you're into the higher percentages that we talked about. So there are lots of variables and new criteria and things change, making it harder still. And finally, I love this one. Replication success was better predicted by the strength of the original evidence. <laughs> better evidence is better evidence, okay? So we don't need to reproduce everything if we have better evidence. So what's reproducible? Are earthquakes reproducible? So we need all the seismologists to go and shake your house again to see if it had the same effect? Might not be ethical. Mathematics, as was mentioned earlier, are easy to reproduce. Botanical studies and life studies are harder to reproduce. Human studies are very difficult to reproduce and perhaps unethical at certain stages. And psychology studies are perhaps the most difficult because human studies on cultures and soft variables. The old person of 30 years ago is very different from the old person nowadays due to advances in science. So to have that, did, was that taken into account? That there's greater mobility, there's a different stereotype, that 50's the new 40, that 60's the new 30. And then especially in human trials, there's the concept of first, best, and last. The first is the breakthrough that shifts the paradigm. The best study is the best one we currently have. And then at a certain point, you have to accept that there's probably a last study, that the risk-benefit curve is not going to pay off to do another study of that magnitude, of that condition with those people. We now have enough evidence to put that to rest until some tremendous first makes us revisit it. But to put another 10,000 people through a replication event is not ethical. We also have epistemological problem. So what is poison? I, was, I love this. There was a, a person who deals with toxicology interviewed recently, and actually our atmosphere is mildly poisonous. That's why we age and die. But it takes a long time. 
So is our air poisonous? Yeah. What's aging? We don't know how to define that precisely. We use the word a lot. What is human? A low percentage of your cells actually contain human DNA. We're now finding that your community of cells, mostly bacteria, and you have a cloud of bacteria around you. That's why you catch colds. And what is sick? You probably have a lot of invasive bacteria on your skin and in your gut right now, but they aren't yet at a threshold level that will make you sick. So are you just pre-sick? <clears throat> One of the big issues around flying, which you're all going to be doing soon, is over the Aleutian Islands, there are a lot of migrating birds. And there's a lot of concern about them striking jet engines and bringing planes down. So a team of researchers, and this is an interesting point too to bring into this, a team of researchers split between the US and Japan wanted to study this because both their countries have a lot of interest in making sure that planes don't fall down over the Aleutian Islands. You'll notice one thing that's happened in the last 20 years is that the incredible increase in collaborative science because of email and online communications. You have much larger author sets. So they needed an index bird because they weren't going to go get a bunch of geese. They weren't convenient. So they said, well, we'll do turkeys. So they agreed they were going to throw turkeys at jet engines and see what damage they did so they could measure that. But they weren't getting the same data on either side of the Pacific. And they couldn't figure it out. They talked, they had conference calls, all this. Finally, the US scientists had to go over and see what their Japanese counterparts were doing, throwing at these jet engines. <clears throat> the US were using fresh, the Japanese were using frozen. They hadn't thought to differentiate and clarify with each other which was which. Now, is that nefarious? Is that a terrible thing? Or is that just the fact that science is a human endeavor with all those kinds of fresh frozen problems? The refrigerator problem. Groups studying the same stem cell lines weren't getting the same results across the US, east coast, west coast. Had all the variables settled, the same, the same cell lines. Finally, the one group had to fly out to the other group and they realized they were storing theirs higher up in the refrigerator. So the temperature was a little different, but worse, the vibration from the fan was disrupting the cells. Mm -hmm. They didn't think of that. <coughs> Equipment malfunctions. There's still a persistent myth out there that the caldera under Yellowstone Park is going to explode imminently, all because in February of 2014, a seism uh, seismology tool malfunctioned and threw off an aberrant reading in publicly available data. So conspiracy theorists got hold of this and are now promulgating and still promulgating the myth that the caldera is about to explode. Open data, transparency, myth. Can't be reproduced. So reproducibility requires the same experimental controls and materials. Reanalysis is another version of this that's, that people are talking about. Um, and getting complete data, as you can see, is tricky. Science itself is basically reproducibility. That's what we do. And, but is reanalysis science. So motivations also come into this. So you remember Google flu? It was supposed to be able to take search, uh, prevalence of search terms and predict when there was going to be a flu outbreak. Well, it turned out when they compared it to empirical data, it was overestimating it by a factor of two. So analyzing indirect data wasn't good. They could have reanalyzed that all they wanted, but they needed empirical data. This is one of my favorites. So there was a study done of kidney cancer rates. And they found that in uh, counties that were prim primarily Republican, had lower educational attainment, and were politically conservative, the kidney cancer rates were the highest. So they drew all sorts of inferences about that until another group came in and said, well, actually, if you look at it, the areas that have, uh, are predominantly Republican, have lower educational attainment, and are politically conservative, have the lowest kidney cancer rates. Now, why would that be? Any guesses? Because they're rural. They have fewer people in them. 
So the chances are greater that you're going to have no kidney cancer in an area with few people. So your rate is zero, the lowest it can be. And one person with it takes your rate to be much greater than any urban area with a few cases. So interpretation of data is really important, too. It can be driven by all sorts of things, and you can misinterpret it. The reanalyses of 13 null medical trials that were reanalyzed more than 80% said you should have more patients treated, longer treatment time, or additional treatment. Actually, 92% of those reanalyses. So by rea the original trials, no result. The reanalysis, you take more drugs for a longer time. Interesting. Why do you think that would happen? This is just to show reanalysis is not a godsend. It can be used to drive agendas just as much as anything else. This is one that was recently, there's a trial called the PACE trial. And this was an interesting, on, on, the, on the PLOS blog, this came up over the weekend. Uh, this a whole, a very, very sophisticated sounding analysis of the controversy and all this until you get to this. And here's the giveaway. I have not given up on my efforts to get the data to demonstrate that this trial did not show that psychotherapy extends the survival of cancer patients. So he puts his agenda out right there. He can't get the data. He thinks this exists. But I'm blocked. We have a lot of people who are trying to use science as a cudgel for various things or to forward a purpose. In the U.S., we have our Congress doing that, bless their hearts. So in this case, we're talking about climate change, which has been an area of controversy. And they're using this transparency argument in order to prosecute scientists. Murray then declared that the American Meteorology, Me Meteorology Association and Union of Concerned Scientists also need to be investigated. Okay, so. We don't think their science is quite up to snuff, so they're going to investigate them. And I'm proud to be part of an organization that is fighting this, because they're trying to make it about the scientists, not the science, which is something that the reproducibility actually does to an extent. Because this is a, what it brings to mind is, why does this happen? Why do we have things that aren't reproducible? And as you can see, part, there are many possible reasons. Either the people trying to do the reproduction aren't good at it, or they have an agenda, if you always have a publication environment that is driving novel results, maybe the novel result is to make it so it's not reproduced. But we tend to think that initially the sensationalism around this puts everything up in this quadrant. It's intentional and significant malfeasance. Mm. Something was wrong here. It was pee hacking or it was something else. Something terrible happened here. I don't believe it. I think it's lower grade first of all, and it can be in any one of these four. It can be intentional and insignificant. You know, who cares if you read the word, you know, uh, creaky and you walk a little slower. Um, unintentional and insignificant, so on and so forth. And I think most of them are probably in that lower half. And the ones we really need to care about are the unintentional significant ones. The intentional significant ones are scandalous. I just like to put this picture up, <laughs> make sure everybody pay attention. One of the things that you'll find is that reproducibility and even the simplest human activities is difficult. How many of you bake? How many of you always see adjustments for altitude in your recipes? <laughs> Not often. I used to live in Salt Lake City, Utah, altitude about 4,600 feet. We always used to have flat cookies. Just this weekend, we made my daughter red velvet cake for her birthday. We'd used a family recipe that was in a cookbook put together by a boosters club. The person was such a good cook that she forgot to say what temperature to bake it at and for how long, because she just knew. It turned out, because we looked it up in another recipe. Again, the number of authors has proliferated. If this is a human endeavor, you now have more humans involved in it. That may make it so we need to put more strictures around the reporting, of course. But it also makes it more likely that there's going to be something forgotten inadvertently, something left out of the report inadvertently. And 
That's interesting. So when, this was a uh, Twitter stream this last week, and when a manuscript with 20 plus authors has grammatical errors, typos, and or no page numbers, you wonder how many authors actually read it. So author accountability is a big issue. Maybe too many making changes for proper version control to be maintained. Again, a human endeavor, it's really tough to do. These papers are hard to put together. The reports are hard to put together. And many, many of these authors assume that the basics are someone else's responsibility. So you have that aspect too. Again, this isn't to excuse anything, but it, we need to realize that science is a human endeavor, these are human beings, and we need to, I don't think there's anything nefarious going on necessarily, but we need to put things in place that are collaborative and helpful, and to Emily's point, help educate them about the importance of this and how they can avoid these mistakes, because I think they're as embarrassed as anybody when they happen. Thanks. Thanks.